Okay, how do I make you a host? Oh, I see it, I see it. You are the host. Yes, can you look and see? Yeah. You're very welcome. Do you have everything you need? No, you're fine. You're you're fine. You're good. So if I log out, you'll be okay. Recording in progress.
Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Welcome, and welcome to those who are joining us uh, online as well. Uh, my name is Ron Brand. I'm a professor here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and I'm also academic director of our Center for International Legal Education. And I want to welcome you on behalf of both of those. Uh, this is the 30th annual McLean Lecture on World Law. Uh, it is the premier international law lecture here at the law school each year. Uh, it was begun uh, to honor Mac McLean. Mac McLean was a Pittsburgher, an internationalist, and as he, after World War II was one of those who created what was called the World Federalist Association, a group that worked toward uh, peaceful resolution of disputes, uh, world peace through world law. Uh, the World Federalist Association of Pittsburgh no longer e exists. Max uh, was also very much involved with the international organization. Uh, and originally this lecture was, was co-sponsored by the World Federalist Association of Pittsburgh and our Center for International Legal Education. CILE has kept it going because we think honoring Mac McLean's name is worthwhile and because it's been an important event. Uh, past speakers uh, have been president judge of uh, ICJ, first woman who uh, judge on the European Court of Justice. We've had uh, solicitors general from an, and attorneys general from another number of countries. We've had prosecutors from the Nuremberg trials. Uh, we've had all kinds of uh, professors and scholars uh, on international law. And uh, I think uh, we'll find that uh, tonight's speaker certainly is going to rise to the top of, of that auspicious uh, list. Uh, we, uh, this year, uh, we are incorporating uh, the lecture into something that is, is special here at the law school, a special project, and I think you'll hear more about it, our rule of law fellows. When we created the Center for International Legal Education in 1995, uh, we pretty quickly uh, began to focus on working with law schools and legal systems in transition countries. And we've done that uh, for quite some time. Uh, we're, and this year we have nine Ukrainian students who are supported uh, not just by CILA and the law school, but by a number of law firms and corporations and foundations uh, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, but we have eight Ukrainians, three uh, from Afghanistan in, in that rule of law fellows uh, program. Uh, we began part of that outreach as early as 1999 in Donetsk, Ukraine at Donetsk National University, which no longer is there in Donetsk, at least the part we work uh, with. Uh, but it's been a focus of the center all along, and we are using this uh, event and occasion to highlight that uh, as, as well. Uh, now, uh, I, uh, my job here is, is to welcome you, uh, explain a little bit of history, and then get out of the way. So I'm going to turn things over uh, to Professor Charles Kotubi. Uh, Chuck is the executive director of the Center for International Legal Education. He's been with us for a year and a half. Uh, and he's already done amazing things uh, for the center and uh, for the law school. He brings uh, intelligence, experience, connections, and a whole lot of energy uh, to the process. Uh, and tonight, uh, he brings our speaker to us, Ambassador uh, Norm Eisen. And so I'm going to turn over to Chuck and let him introduce our speaker, and we'll get on with the show. But again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are here in the room will have a, a reception afterwards immediately out on, on this floor. So I hope you'll join us afterwards for some informal follow-up conversation. Uh, those of you who are joining us uh, online, I hope you'll find some way to replicate that for yourselves and continue to think about uh, what is discussed here this evening. Again, thank you for joining us. So we're going to talk today about 
corruption, anti-corruption, and the rule of law, a little bit about Ukraine as well. So if you allow me, Norm, I'm going to do five minutes to set the stage for the substance of the topic. Do it. Okay. Um, so in 2017, I co-authored a book um, whose goal was to catalog the general principles of law that everyone can agree. No matter where you're from or what legal background, you agree that these are general principles of law that adhere to the rule of law. And one of those in, in, in Chapter 3 was juridical acts born of fraud and corruption carry no legal force. Everyone can agree to that. Every legal system in the world can agree to that. And my students know, I always say this, is that the law on paper is wonderful, isn't it? Right? Unfortunately, it's not the reality in, in, in most of the world. Every jurisdiction in the world condemns corruption, yet corruption is everywhere. Uh, UN statistics show that uh, it costs emerging countries $1.26 trillion annually. They impede the uh, realization of human rights, jeopardize economic development, undermine the legitimacy of government institutions, and the rule of law itself. Today we are at, we see with Ukraine and Afghanistan, we're at the cusp of a fundamental realignment in global priorities um, uh, and global powers around the world. The last century has really brought down walls, it's brought down sovereignty in a way, and it's brought us together. Um, and the erosion of state sovereignty has made us realize that there are certain fundamental rules that adhere everywhere, right? There are certain principles that define the minimum standard of rights in, in, in the rule of law. Um, old orders rarely fall quietly, unfortunately. And we're seeing countries, right, like Ukraine, Afghanistan, Myanmar, are at the front lines of this human struggle for dignity and democracy. Um, and so we're joined today, I want to introduce our courageous friends from Ukraine and Afghanistan, um, who we want to talk optimistically, but realistically, about the futures of your countries. Um, and if the hu universal human rights that developed over the last century are gonna be realized through the interconnectedness of capital and trade, we need to make sure that the governments in these places at the front line have the tools to safeguard those benefits for their citizens and not to see the new oligarchs that takes them away. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm joined here by Ambassador Norm Eisen. Um, he's a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institute where he chairs the institution's signature anti-corruption program, Leveraging Transparency to Reduce Corruption, and is the founder and the lead editor of the Brookings Sanctions Tracker. While working at the White House, the press dubbed him Mr. No and the ethics czar for his tough anti-corruption approach. Today, Ambassador Eisen represents Brookings as the civil society chair of the Financial Transparency and Integrity Cohort for the Biden administration's second summit for democracy, which we're gonna talk about today. So please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Norm Eisen here to Pitt Law for a discussion about these topics. So thank you. So I, I wanna start sort of big picture and, and, and say you know, corruption is not just a faraway problem of emerging democracies, right? You know, there are billions of dollars flowing into any country, moving around any country, you're gonna have scandals are bound to happen. Um, we saw this with uh, you know, the COVID-19 relief plans. We saw this with the Paycheck Protection Plan. 10% of the program's funds were misappropriated, <laughs> right? Um, where is the systematic failure, the systemic failure that leads to this, even in countries like the United States? Um, Chuck, uh, I'm gonna answer <laughs> on where the systemic failure lies, really, it's a complex of systems failures that cause that. But if you'll permit me first. Absolutely. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Law, your um, CILE program, your founder, Professor Ron Brand, for his generous introduction, uh, Dean Haider Hamoudi, who greeted me when, uh, when I strolled in from the rain. I took a wonderful tour around the Cathedral of Learning uh, and the campus to get the oxygen flowing into my brain. I want to thank you, Chuck, in your capacity as the Executive Director of the Center for International Legal Education. And I was so excited to come and visit with you today because of your 11 rule of law scholars, uh, eight from Ukraine and three from Afghanistan, and the importance of that program uh, in dealing with uh, what uh, Mac McLean, uh, uh, I think they would have called him 
a globalist. That has become a bad word in certain <laughs> corners, not to me. Uh, the notion uh, that the world is not, and this goes to your question about corruption here in the United States, Chuck, the notion that the, the world is not such a large place and um, we live on it together. We have a duty to help each other. When I was ambassador uh, and talking about uh, corruption, I came from the White House, as you heard from Chuck, where my job, President Obama gave me, it's my law school classmate, we'd been friends for a long time, he says, I want to have the first administration that has no scandals whatsoever. I feel sure he told me, I don't want a special counsel. I don't want any special prosecutor to have to be appointed. And in fact, my title was special counsel in the White House to prevent. So you're the only special counsel I want. And in fact, to this day, because of the anti-corruption measures we took to deal with these factors that Chuck has identified, and they're fundamentally the same everywhere. Because of those measures we took within the Obama administration, it was the most scandal-free. It was followed by perhaps the most scandalous administration, uh, that presidential administration that we've had in modern, in modern times. Um, and the, the systems that I designed for President Obama, I then carried over. And when I went to serve as ambassador in Prague, the Czech Republic, they said to the foreign minister, uh, and he made the mistake of saying this on the record, Chuck, it was very controversial. They said, well, this Ambassador Eisen is coming, he was in charge of corruption, preventing corruption in the White House. They ha we have such problems in the Czech Republic. What will he think when he comes from Washington to Prague? And he said, he won't believe his eyes. <laughs> and he, the people got very angry. Like, why is he disparaging Minister Schwarzenberg? Why was he disparaging? But it goes to this problem, and we saw it. I wrote about it at Brookings at the time that we needed to have much stronger anti-corruption safeguards in place as the current uh, president, then vice president, said to me when I was getting ready to go serve abroad, and I met with, uh, with Joe Biden about um, uh, his insights on how to deal with this problem. I said, Mr. Vice President, do you think we can ever cure corruption? Can we ever get rid of it altogether? He said, Norm, it's like mowing the lawn. Just comes back, you gotta fight it over and over again. Why, at last, to get to your question, why is that? Uh, some of that is that there, let's be honest, uh, there are dishonest people out there. Even in the midst of Ukraine's war effort, and as committed as the Ukrainian people are, and people all over the world, I'm so proud to be one of those who's trying to help in my own way. I've gone to Europe to, to work on the reconstruction package supporting Ukraine in various ways here. We'll talk about that. Even in the midst of that, you can have a massive corruption scandal that has led in recent days to a series of firings up to and including the defense minister, the person who's in charge of defending the country in a time of war. So we have that challenge. That is a challenge in human nature. Not everyone who falls prey to corruption, there are some, and I won't, characterized because they're in the beginning of investigating there's an appearance problem in Ukraine and they're dealing with the appearances. We'll see who is actually responsible, what they did, was that minister actively involved or did it just happen on his watch and the president who ran on an anti-corruption platform, among other things, lost confidence. We'll see, there are allegations, we'll see. Um, the, but not everyone who gets involved in this uh, is, uh, is, is uh, an innately bad person. I use, there are some who are. They go into government or they go into business to steal. That is their uh, life objective, Chuck. But not everyone. Many others, and this is really where I focused, I told President Obama, look, 
we have to screen to keep the corruptors out. And we set up a very elaborate personnel screening system so we wouldn't, you know, and we kept some good people out because we were so strict. And some of them were very angry at me. Um, uh, and we fired some who then sued me. So they were even angrier if we thought they, that there were issues with them. And, but, but then, you, you, for the ones who come through, you have to construct systems. And this was my, and I wrote about it at the time, and I'm writing about it now with Ukraine. It's a global phenomenon. You have to construct systems, and Madison writes about this in the Federalist Papers, to assure that uh, good people, decent people, average people, but human people who are subject to temptation do not fall victim. What can you do to assure that those who come into government will actually serve the public interest? That is a critical problem uh, that unites. It's the, unify, the unifying question of our domestic anti-corruption work and the global legal problem of how you promote integrity and solve uh, for corruption. How can you assure that most of those, the vast majority of those who come, keep the thieves out, and then for everyone else who comes in, build a system of rules? Uh, and I developed some thoughts on that in my years leading up to the White House, in the White House, as ambassador, and since. Right. One of the problems you have, though, is the written laws can do very little, right? You can have a raw condem law condemning corruption, and it can do very little. What you're yes, talking about Yes, those here, are the juridical acts that you wrote about in chapter three, Exactly, Chuck. exactly. But what you don't have here, what, what, you, what you're saying here is you have to go for the culture of the public servant is critical, right? And is it harder? Let's, let's shift to Ukraine and Afghanistan now. Let's shift there. It's harder in countries in crisis, right? Because you have this vicious cycle of crisis leads to corruption, leads to more crisis, leads to corruption, and then the downward spiral begins. Have you seen that when you were ambassador? When well, you were? yes, yeah. but I was taught by the best in the political business. You know, my life, even sitting here next to you, Chuck, is somewhat of a accident. I thank my uh, law school admissions office that let me into the same class as Barack Obama. So when I came into government, you know, I had worked as a lawyer. I had never, I had represented government officials for many years, but I had never actually worked in the government when I entered the government uh, at the end of 2008 and then into 2009. And, but I learned from the best. And one of the ones, and he's an ambassador now, uh, uh, he's got to be the least likely ambassador uh, that you would ever choose, but he's doing a wonderful job. Rahm Emanuel, who was the famously blunt, profane, tough uh, um, former congressman, mayor of Chicago, chief of staff for President Obama. And apropos of your question, he taught me, I used to, he used to say all the time, when we went into the government because we were facing two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, and the subprime financial collapse, the Great Recession, which could have easily been a Great Depression, but for, uh, but for the wise uh, stewardship of um, the Bush administration, economic team, and President Bush, and then our team that took over. Um, it really could have gone the wrong way, and above all, Ben Bernanke, who's a scholar, my Brookings colleague now, who's a scholar of the Great Depression and learned how not to uh, replicate it. Rom said to me, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think when you come to Ukraine, if you look at, not at the allegations that have led to all these firings, up to and including the defense minister, but if you look at the speed with which the government has moved, if you look at the seriousness of the commitment that they've made, if you look at the fact that Ukrainian civil society, like the RISE coalition, has been so active, the Prozoro procurement transparency system that they have in Ukraine. Now they have uh, the successor uh, to Prozoro, the next generation that's gonna help track some of the spending 
uh, that's coming in. There's a commitment to deal with corruption that is also born of the crisis. They can't afford to have corruption or the appearance of corruption. And so I prefer to look at the crisis and say they've learned from experience. I've written about we made terrible mistakes after the Cold War in how we transitioned European countries in Iraq and Afghanistan. We fostered the, the United States and its allies fostered the corruption. It seems like we're learning to do better and the Ukrainians are seizing the moment. This is the crisis that we need to take advantage of to move Ukraine forward into a, a, a less corrupt system is what you're saying, right? Now, this isn't the first time that, that Ukraine sort of made anti-corruption commitments. And then we go back to pre-war to December of 21 when President Zelensky made some anti-corruption commitments at the first Summit for Democracy. Yes. Can you talk, for, first of all, what is the Summit for Democracy? Um, and, 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 and what was it and what is it moving forward? By pure coincidence, yep. I have a copy of the Ukraine commitments <laughs> right here, Chuck. I wonder how that happened. Um, the uh, President Biden uh, is, um, is very uh, focused on um, this interaction that we started with, the threat to democracies around the world, including in the United States. And we saw an attempted coup in the United States in 2020 and the aftermath of the 2020 election and into 2021 with the violence that disrupted. Uh, it was the first non-peaceful transition in American history. You could argue that some of the uh, uh, southern states that seceded uh, objected. They would not accept Lincoln's um, accession to the presidency in 1860. However, his actual transition was not disrupted. They rejected it. Um, a number of states refused to recognize him, but he transitioned into office. He took the, he took the hand off. Um, so um, um, as a result of that, President Biden wanted to focus on the health of democracies. And it's very apropos of our conversation because he has three pillars in his view of his democracy strategy. Uh, and one of those three, this is how important anti-corruption is, one of those three is fighting corruption. So he decided to convene a summit, the first summit on democracy. And that uh, took place last year. And, and um, uh, brought together um, over 100 countries from all over the world that made commitments in each of the core areas, these three core areas. And Ukraine was one of the participants, and they made a series of uh, commitments, including, that, and we saw the fruits of those commitments in the reaction to this corruption scandal. They agreed to adopt a new anti-corruption strategy to coordinate all of the corruption work that's so important to prevent it from being splintered and fragmented. Uh, and they did that. They agreed to increase transparency and accountability in management uh, of uh, public finances uh, and to introduce innovative digital technologies along the lines of Prezoro. So they are executing on each of these commitments. Now we'll have the second democracy summit and as Chuck said, I co-chair what you can think of as the anti-corruption cohort. Government, I do it with the State Department, government and civil society with another civil society group. We at Brookings are the co-chair. Uh, bringing together both official and uh, NGO representatives from all over the world, including from Ukraine. Uh, to uh, think about how, can, how has it gone over the past year? What are the commitments? Have the commitments been met or not? And where do we go from here? So that is what the second Democracy Summit at the end of March will do. Uh, and we're very, very uh, excited to be welcoming uh, countries. We've already been talking to countries who have made these commitments, welcoming countries and civil society groups from all over the world. And Ukraine is one of them? 
Ukraine is a very active participant. Wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. So you said something that I want, I want to pick up on. You said civil society groups. And, and this is something that I, I just recently taught my human rights class. My human rights class has been here about corruption and the human right to be free from corruption. And the fact that there's always two to tango in corrupt scandals, corruption scandals. It's not always the governments, but it's private actors too, right? What can we do as lawyers to encourage less corruption, anti-corruption for the private sector? Well, Chuck, you and I come to our uh, public service from uh, having been partners in law firms. And um, I don't know about you, uh, every client I ever had that was accused of corruption was completely innocent. Always. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, but everybody else's clients had a lot of problems. Uh, and so I think that, I think that uh, everybody has something to contribute. Um, I believe that um, having a functioning legal system, and the United States has been uh, out front on this with strong anti-corruption laws, like it was a world leader when we passed it, the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which limits U.S. companies from engaging in corrupt activity. That system around the FCPA would not work without the private lawyers who represent companies, not just what they get in trouble, but to try to counsel them, keep them out of trouble, Correct. right? Correct. Negotiating settlements. If a company got in trouble, you're a private lawyer, negotiate a consent decree. That's usually how FCPA cases are resolved. So you really help, even representing those who are accused of wrongdoing, you can help. For civil society groups, of course, um, we need to insist on uh, as better, stronger, and faster commitments and enforcement of those commitments. You know, corruption is illegal all over the world. But you, if you look at the books, going back to Chuck's chapter number three, if you look at the laws on the books, they are terrific. But then, uh, the OECD surveys every year, how many corruption prosecutions did you have? How many convictions? And that's where you really see, you really see it tail off and you get down in the single digits in some countries, zero. So we know that those are not islands of purity, those places where uh, where the numbers are zero. It's not being enforced. And civil society, government has to step up. Civil society has to step up. Now that can be very dangerous. Look at uh, uh, Mr. Navalny. Yeah. I had yeah. the pleasure of meeting him, our great Russian crusader for democracy and against corruption. Um, uh, 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 you know, he's now, the regime, the Putin regime does not want him out and about, and they've got him in jail in a prison camp, far off prison camp on trumped up charges. So it can be very dangerous. I've talked to so many activists, and not just around the world. Right here, this is why I'm a, I don't know, I would shock some of my conservative Friends, Ralph, if I told them that, uh, like uh, Mac McLean, I'm a confirmed federalist, <laughs> global federalist, right? This, the United States has the same problems. It can be very dangerous, including for whistleblowers right here in the United States when they want to blow the whistle on corruption. Furious retaliation rains down on them. When I was in the White House, I would go to whistleblower conferences, I would give my number out, say, call me, because I felt they really got, and many did, uh, I felt they really got a raw deal, and often they're complicated, sometimes they themselves were uh, implicated, you know, you have the, uh, our greatest, I'm friends with two of our greatest whistleblowers, I never thought I, in the United States, I never thought I'd be able to say this. Both Republicans, by the way. John Dean, we got to be friendly because we're both on CNN. He's a, I can say that John is a friend of mine. And uh, the modern, in my view, the modern John Dean, Michael Cohen, who blew the whistle, was an accomplice. He was involved in the campaign finance wrongdoing. He blew the whistle on Donald Trump. 
So it's, that's not an easy, that's not an easy um, road to hoe when you, when you choose to expose corruption. So that's one last thing to answer your question that all of us can do, support those people. I call uh, uh, my, still some of those whistleblowers who called me in the White House more than, let's see, 2009, I probably started getting those calls. So uh, 14 years ago, I'm still talking to some of those folks to support them, just emotional support, being a friend, uh, someone to talk to. It's the most simple human thing that every one of us uh, has the opportunity to do. You, you, you hit on this point several times, and I can say, I've been on several Brookings calls over the past year or so on all your projects, and two words I hear a lot, investigative journalism. Yes. And how important it is here in this country and around the world. And it seems like you, in Brookings in general, is doing a lot of work on promoting investigative journalism. Can you talk about how that feeds into this as well? Yeah, there's, um, in the model of fighting corruption, you have your official uh, modalities. Uh, the, you've got to have those juridical systems. You need laws. Uh, you need courts, sometimes specialized anti-corruption courts. Our courts are strong here in the United States. Well, I'll tell you a story. Even judges are not immune from the attacks that when they try to fight corruption. Uh, tell a story about a friend of mine in a moment who's a federal judge. Um, but we have, you need a court system, you need prosecutors, you need defense lawyers because the system doesn't work without um, representation. Um, and um, uh, the, that's the official law enforcement structure. But um, it is not alone enough to fight corruption. You need organic systems as well that will expose corruption uh, if the uh, officials are not getting to it. And one of the most important of those systems, uh, NGOs, uh, nonprofit advocacy groups, uh, one I started, CREW, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, is now a big US anti-corruption group. Um, but I really think you need to keep investigative journalism strong because in dollar for dollar you get the most return on investment. It's relatively inexpensive, but it produces so much sunlight, so much news of uh, wrongdoing. Um, I, I s saw this uh, myself uh, in... Uh, uh, in Europe, and I saw the backlash. And here's, there's ways you have to ask yourself with investigative journalism, how can we support journalists across Central and Eastern Europe? It's my region, I study it closely. We had journalist after journalist who was uncovering wrongdoing, and then the oligarchs would come after him and sue him, typically in London, because the legal system is much more favorable to a plaintiff in London, and these are what in the United States we call slap suits. They're strategic litigation to punish. The oligarch can afford to litigate, a journalist cannot. Now, I'm so proud of the United States State Department, USAID, they're my co-chairs on this summit. They just announced a, a journalism insurance program so that there will be a pooled resource so when a journalist gets sued, they can afford, they can buy the insurance. The United States is making it available at a very subsidizing it. They can get the insurance and then they can have a defense. So they don't have to be afraid of being unjustly targeted. So, um, so that, is, that is why journalism is so important, but we have to find creative ways to support it. My friend, Ambassador Mark Gittenstein, who's currently the US ambassador to the EU, is one of our great champions of anti-corruption. We served together, he was the ambassador to Romania when I was in the Czech Republic, and he's one of the great anti-corruption advocates and, and has been an innovator in the US-EU relationship in developing awareness and ways to help investigative journalism. In the time we have, I know we have a bunch of keys. We have a lot of questions, okay? So I'm gonna open it up just 
you. I have some more questions myself, but I want to make sure that you all have the time to ask your questions too. And um, I know a few of you have run them by me, um, and, and they're great questions. Uh, before we do that, I want to, in the room and to everyone online, I want to say thanks. You, we wouldn't be getting these questions from these students if it were not for the firms and corporations who sponsored them and helped us bring them here. And, and I have the list here because I can usually do it by heart because I know our, our good friends here. I have to give thanks to PNC Bank, CNX Resources, Duquesne Light, MSA Safety, Matthews International, Jones Day, Canel Gates, Cozen O'Connor, Leach Tishman, and Babs Cowan. These students are here learning about the US legal system, about anti-corruption, about the importance of all these issues because of these firms and corporations who've given us this support. So, I want to have the student questions. Um, Ole, where are you at? All right, you sent me a great question earlier and I want you to ask uh, Ambassador Eisen your question. Um, thank you very much for this lecture. Um, it was really interesting to listen to you and uh, I hope that me and my classmates who are here uh, after this uh, program, we will come back to Ukraine and we will implement our experience and our knowledge that we gain here uh, to make our country better, especially in terms of fighting corruption. So uh, my question was, um, I just recall the events of Revolution of Dignity in 2014 and uh, I was one of the participants there, and I remember the mood and the atmosphere during um, those days in, in Maidan in Kyiv. And there was a lot of hope among my friends uh, that we can, you know, like begin the new page of our history um, after our victory. So, um, unfortunately, we did not manage to succeed. Um, I mean, the Ukraine uh, became a better country in terms of fighting corruption after that, but still there, uh, there are a lot of problems in our country. And uh, like my question to you is, how do you think is whether um, nowadays events in Ukraine, the current events, will they help us to become maybe more of a society and to succeed in fighting um, corruption. As a Thank you for that good question. I'll just repeat it um, for everyone's benefit. Will the current events, current crisis, help Ukraine to become a better, more effective country and to do a better job of fighting corruption? Um, I hope the answer will be yes. We know more now than we knew three weeks ago because we hadn't had the first post-war corruption controversy scandal yet. So what we saw was swift action by the president, forceful action, and uh, a demonstrated commitment to integrity. I have been writing a lot. I, I reviewed them all to come and talk to you today. I, I, I've written nine essays in uh, the past seven months or so, emphasizing support for Ukraine, including support for Ukrainian anti-corruption efforts, and that the, the donor countries really need to make this a priority. Ukraine has actually improved in over the past year in the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. Uh, Ukraine has gone from uh, the low 120s and has improved four or five slots. Still, uh, there's a long way to go. I think the ranking is 116th in the world this year. So there's 115, according, you have to take these indices with a grain of salt, there's, a, there's 115. But if that progress, it's four or five positions a year, if that continues year after year after year, you're gonna see really measurable improvement. So um, I think that the, um, the president of Ukraine, his government, but the people of Ukraine 
civil society in Ukraine, and the um, partners, the allies of Ukraine, understand integrity has to be a priority for the country truly to be successful. The dignity that the revolution of dignity was about comes if you can um, have those measurable improvements in anti-corruption. The United States is not perfect in this regard. We have plenty of challenges, and we've been going down for years in these rankings. Um, so we have work to do as well. But still, we, I said I would tell this story. Even the United States judicial system is the envy of the world. We really have a very independent, strong, sometimes a little slow, very independent, strong judicial system. But I have a friend who was a federal judge who was in, in Boston investigating corruption in the FBI, and corrupt FBI agents created a phony scandal and falsely accused him. A federal judge was a victim of this kind of retaliation. Now, it came out, but it was very uh, awful for him to have those kinds of public accusations. So the United States has plenty of work to do, but I'm hopeful. And now we see the evidence of Ukraine's strong response to this scandal. I'm hopeful that we're going to see uh, continued improvement, and so many Ukrainian lives have been lost for the hope you express to fulfill the purpose of the, the revolution of dignity and Euromaidan. One thing, if I can add, is, um, and it picks up on a lot of things you said, is even before the current crisis and current war, I've done a lot of legal work in Ukraine. And the one thing I always notice is the quality of lawyers in Ukraine mm -hmm. is very high compared to other countries like it. And it, it really, really is. But not a lot of those lawyers are going into public service or were going into public service. And maybe this war will, will, will start a new wave of, of, of lawyers like huh. yourselves wanting to go into public service, which will make it better. And that's, that's one hope uh, we have. Tatiana, you had a question. Would you like to ask it? I'm going to interrupt just a moment, Chuck, though, yeah. to say the quality of lawyers in Ukraine is, I think, part of what we've helped accomplish here. Because we have, more, here. we have more LLM graduates from Pitt Law in Ukraine than any other country. And I mm -hmm. like to, th and some of them are in positions that are very important right now. I like to think that's been a contribution to that. Thank you. Um, from the inside, uh, we see a lot of changes, a lot of reforms, uh, anti-corruption reforms in judicial system, education, and uh, public health. Do you see uh, this um, progress from the outside? Uh, we do see it from, from the outside. Um, my own principal engagement is with the Ukrainian anti-corruption civil society. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, Prozoro, for example, uh, that is in uh, public procurement. And uh, we've seen fantastic results from that system, even with other countries. This is a very transparent um, IT system uh, to track um, uh, public procurement. Even with other countries saying, hey, I can learn from that. So I have been very impressed. Again, my colleagues in Ukraine, I, when I went to this reconstruction conference, in Berlin, I was invited by the German government to be a United States expert on corruption issues, dealing with corruption issues in the reconstruction of Ukraine. And uh, I was, there weren't many civil society representatives. So I spent, I joined the Ukrainian civil society delegation. There were two people from Brookings, myself and a colleague who were there, not too many others. Uh, so I spent time with the, um, with the Ukrainian civil society, and I was really impressed as an outsider with the accomplishments. I'm watching, we're learning now. Ukraine still has a reputation as being a relatively more corrupt place than in Western Europe. So we have to overcome that. How? Just what the government is doing now 
strong action against the appearance of corruption. The appearance, that is what you, uh, that is what you need to do. So yes, I think the world is looking, I hope people are not saying, looking at these firings and say, look, it's proof that Ukraine is corrupt. No, it's proof that Ukraine doesn't want corruption. Open it up, other questions? Oh, I know you had a question. Thank you so much. It's very, very important um, issue. And I would like to ask you about justice system, because according to the United States Agency for International Development, one of the main causes of corruption in Ukraine is um, a compromised justice system. What do you think are the main steps Ukraine should take to fight corruption uh, in the justice system? Well, the model for uh, lifting up a judicial system um, is, um, has been well established. We know what works if you can do it. Number one, you have to pay a decent salary to judges so that they don't have to supplement their salary with bribes. So you need to make, you have to have the proper financial wherewithal. Two, you do need to um, set up a, um, a training system. And that includes not only ch selecting judges. In the United States, we have a very elaborate judicial selection system. We let our prosecutorial bodies be a training ground. The most outstanding prosecutors become judges. Uh, we let the private practice of law the, the, the attorneys who have the best reputation, they become judges. So we need to create that culture. How do you do that? How do you create a culture when you're struggling? It can be small things. That same judge I talked to you about in Boston, Judge Mark Walt, who himself was fighting corruption, then he was the victim of corruption, he defeated corruption. He's bringing Ukrainian judges to the United States this summer to uh, show them how our system works, to give them moral support, to tell them his stories, to inspire them. So we, it's not only a question of what you do in, in Ukraine with funding the position, selecting judges, training judges, um, perhaps having special anti-corruption courts. That's very important because you know you have a higher standard. That's the most dangerous place where if you have a corrupt judge, they'll use those powers. Uh, but also, all of us have a duty to um, be supportive uh, of the judicial system. So um, those are some ideas that have worked in other countries. It's a slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. And you know, some of the people I've met, I saw firsthand, they were introduced to me, oh, this man is going to be a great anti-corruption prosecutor. And then a year later, I'm reading in the paper that he's accused of corruption. Uh, I saw, we saw this in the impeachment. I worked on the first Trump impeachment, where uh, one of the individuals who was working helping the former president with his effort to corrupt Zelensky and get him to um, falsely implicate Biden and the Biden family. One of the individuals was the former anti-corruption prosecutor of Ukraine who had, you know, it seems uh, our embassy felt he was corrupt and he couldn't get in the United States because of those issues. So we need to, we need to work on, work on those, those cultural issues. But I think salaries, training, selection, special anti-corruption courts, uh, and finally, um, everybody being supportive. All of us do our part. When I was in Prague, we have CELI, the Central and Eastern European Legal Initiative, and we welcomed judges from all over the regions, region, including Ukraine, for training. 
there. So we all have to do our part like Judge Wolf is doing this summer. Few questions. Um, my name is Nazir, I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, thank you so much, we are so happy and grateful to have you as uh, our distinguished speaker here discussing about the corruption issues of Afghanistan and uh, Ukraine. I have uh, one general question. Uh, in one estimate by the CIGAR, uh, the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction uh, puts that the total amount is donated by the United States alone to Afghanistan to be valued at like 145 billions of dollar in development assistance over the past 20 years. So looking to these big numbers, too much money with little or no oversight was flooded into Afghanistan, uh, which had no institutional mechanism to properly handle such a resources. So could you pl please explain what were some of the anti-corruption efforts of the international community, in particularly the United States government, a strategic partner of Afghanistan beyond the Afghanistan corruption issue. Thank you. It's estimated, thank you for that very good question, and I'm happy and honored to be here and learning so much from Chuck's good questions and all of yours. Um, in, in Afghanistan, the estimate is that fully <coughs> uh, three out of every $10 was siphoned off to corruption. So tens of billions of dollars on the CGARS numbers. I've heard even larger estimates about the amount that was taken. And I went to Afghanistan myself uh, when General Petraeus was, uh, the, uh, was the United States general, um, the most senior general uh, in, the, uh, in the country. Uh, the U.S., most senior U.S. military official in the country, to consult, among other things I did there because of my anti-corruption expertise. And we did have a big team of people in place in the country by then. This must have been 2013, maybe. We had a team of people trying to work on it from the Pentagon, the Department of Justice, all of the different agencies of the United States to try to help the FBI, um, consultants, retired experts, um, judicial experts. And, but by then, we had already made the mistake of funding some of the corrupt networks because the United States paid. We had other priorities. This is the mistake, um, er, and it's the same with the post-Cold War era, by the way. We had other uh, priorities when we funded uh, the Czech Republic or Slovakia to transition from communism. We didn't emphasize the importance of anti-corruption, unlike President Biden today, where it's one of three pillars of his democracy strategy. We said, well, we need to emphasize, I wrote a whole book about it, Democracy Defenders. I went back and looked, I couldn't believe it. We spent much more on Business, economy, finance. We thought if capitalism takes hold, then democracy will follow behind. And so we, we set up coupon privatization systems that created the oligarchs, the way we restructured. So in Afghanistan, we created the corruption crisis and the seeds of our own exit uh, because in for other reasons, some very good reasons, humanitarian assistance, we would pay the people who then we were feeding the corrupt networks. Directly we would pay, not to mention um, the failure to interdict, to have systems in place where you track every dollar. That's what I'm advocating. I want to learn from those experiences. Central and Eastern Europe, after communism, Afghanistan, Iraq, so I think we need to have very strong um, corruption safeguards and even, it's a dirty word in some places, conditionality. If when we start putting, the estimates are as much as 
500 billion dollars, 500 to 700 billion dollars to reconstruct Afghanistan. When that money starts going in, the, uh, uh, not Afghanistan, Ukraine. When that money starts going into Ukraine, we have to be watching how it's spent. We have to say, hey, here's what we want from the judiciary. These are the benchmarks. And if that's not met, you're not getting the next tranche of funds to really incentivize. Um, and um, I think that needs to be a hallmark. And I said that when I went to the Reconstruction Conference. Uh, and some people said to me, don't you trust us? Some of my Ukrainian friends said, don't you trust us? I said, I quoted Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. <laughs> that is the structure that I think we need to prevent those terrible mistakes from happening again. And it was unfair to the American taxpayers. It was unfair to our allies, unfair to the lives that were lost, but above all, so unfair to the people of Afghanistan that we funded the corruption instead of ending, trying to end the corruption. So I hope we learn from that painful lesson. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned uh, a rice grain coalition, and I have been, and I am proud of being a part of this endeavor. Uh, and uh, time matters. So based on your experience, based on your understanding, uh, how long it will take to overcome corruption? So yeah, you're not a prophet, but probably you have- In Ukraine? Yeah. Or, well, we will never eliminate corruption in the United States and we will never eliminate it. To overcome it, is a multi-generational activity. We are going to need to commit, but it's new, even for the United States, to say, let me tell you what the three things are in, the, uh, in this program. Even for the United States to say, here is how important the fight against corruption is. We're going to have these three pillars of our, um, of our democracy strategy, um, defending against authoritarianism, promoting human rights, and fighting corruption. That is a work of multi-generations, but I hope the, un and Ukraine can't do it alone. If um, there, there's at some point administrations change, even in the House of Representatives, there's a new party that is in charge of the House of Representatives. And they say, well, we don't know if we want to support Ukraine. And one of the things they point to is the corruption. So that's wrong. You should say, we want to support Ukraine, including continuing the fight against corruption. So it's not only for Ukraine to stay in the fight, but for the allies to look at this as a generational uh, task. So I think, you know, it is some measure of generation as 20 years, right? That is, for a true transformation, is a 20, I believe, is a 20 year process. Uh, yes, that Ukraine has strong laws on the books. The problem is not the laws on the books. The problem is the enforcement. There are some who, uh, there have been, there has been enforcement, but there are some who are in positions of power, the so-called oligarchs, who can operate with relative impunity. That is why the question about strengthening the judicial system and the prosecutorial system, it's a problem of implementation. The easy part is putting the laws on the books. Let me say that in the United States, this is also a problem. 
the extremely wealthy in the United States are often able to get away with more. We're having a controversy this week because a friend of mine has written a book, a very, one of our most distinguished former prosecutors, Mark Pomerantz, he was working for the Manhattan DA investigating Trump and he determined there was sufficient evidence to prosecute Trump and then the new DA came in. He's not corrupt, but for a variety of reasons, he slowed it down. It's more than a year and still we haven't seen, the, and the evidence is overwhelming. So you can look at the career of our former president and say, look, the, you know, the very p powerful do things. If I did them or Chuck did them or you did them, we would have been in jail long ago. And that happens, that, that happens in the United States too. But this is an implementation problem, not a problem of the laws on the books or the sentences on the books in Ukraine. In many places, everybody says, oh yes, the UN Convention Against Corruption. We have the best laws, but they don't implement the laws. Um, thank you very much for, for coming and being here. I'm a big fan of Crew. did some work with them uh, a number of years during the Trump administration. Um, a question that arose for me, I'm a tax guy. I, I do tax and nonprofits and so on. And um, Chuck introduced this by noting the COVID uh, uh, money that went out there and got misused. From a tax perspective, it made all the sense in the world because it got money out there fast yes. without the rules. I think I might be hearing you say that that might be sort of part of the same mistake that we made in, uh, uh, in reconstructing countries. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on that. It concerns me because the efficiency you lose out on in that is dramatic, but if it's worse, then maybe you need to change it. Don't hold the flows of cash up, but invest a, a relatively small portion of them in enforcement, in detection, now we're finding out that the social security numbers and the business addresses and the names on some of these PPB loans were non-existent. Well, for, for heaven's sake, hire a few extra people to scan the social security numbers when the applications are coming in. I, at the time, in real time, uh, at Brookings, I wrote a series of essays, and I think I testified in Congress on this, that the, the Trump administration was not taking enforcement seriously. They didn't appoint a strong um, special inspector general. They appointed a, someone who I had some questions about. They didn't invest in proper systems. And they, because it was an administration that itself was so callous to corruption, didn't seem to care if stealing was going on. So you don't have to slow the system down. We were pretty successful. Obama brought, put the vice president uh, in charge, Joe Biden in charge of our stimulus package of the spending that we did, the American Rescue Plan. He got a top inspector general, the best, Earl Devaney, number one. He brought him in to design systems right away. And uh, you know there were occasional hiccups in that in those investments, but on the whole, it was a lower fraud rate than what we saw with the COVID package. So uh, there was there were a, a number of things like that that could have been done, that should have been done, that would not have materially held up pumping. Right, we got to flush the money. In. It worked. <coughs> it worked too well. It over the economy overheated a little bit gave us the inflation that's now coming back under control. Um, but uh, those threshold um, screens and then investing more in people so they can more quickly investigate and let the world know about it because that will scare the corruptors off if they're like, oh, I'm going to be detected. We know that from social science that the certainty of detection is the most uh, effective deterrent. So, um, alas, didn't happen. We have time for one more question. Yeah, um, so <laughs> I wasn't going to ask this question until you used the word perception. And uh, I, I'm a township official in a very rural part of Pennsylvania. 
an hour away from Pittsburgh. And I will tell you, if you go out into the country, people still think everybody's corrupt. And I've seen you on CNN many, many times. Great respect for you. But I still ask, how do you get the message out to a large part of yeah. the population to fulfill that uh, perception part of your uh, No shade on uh, the other networks. But that's part of the reason that I signed with CNN, because I thought, uh, as opposed to some of the other places I might have gone, I, can get, I could get the word out there. Maybe I should have <laughs> tried to negotiate with Fox News, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. I had several bids for my uh, uh, punditry. Um, you know, I, I think that um, if I can shift from financial corruption to political corruption, I think that this um, midterm that we've just come through, uh, which was um, a, um, a historic one, uh, showed that the majority of Americans do not want extreme uh, forms, that form of political corruption that we term election denialism. And so you, you had, when, when you had, uh, to use a term that came up in the January 6th hearings, Team Normal within the Republican Party running, Team Normal did much better than, than Team Crazy, Carrie Lake in, uh, in Arizona, or Hamaday, Abe Hamaday, who was her ticket mate for AG, or Mark Fincham, who was her ticket mate for Secretary of State here in Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano. Look at how far be behind the Republican ticket Doug Mastriano ran relative to Josh Shapiro compared to Team Normal. So to me, that was a vindication, hey, the word is getting out. You know, people don't want that brand of conservatism. And I think if you see some of the competition to the former president, um, both among the influencer class within the Republican Party, I just read today that Club for Growth is not inviting Mr. Trump. Now, I don't agree with the clubs. I do support growth, and I do belong to some clubs, but I don't agree with anything in the Club for Growth, except that they didn't invite Donald Trump to their enclave, okay? Uh, so uh, I do think there's, at the, both at the treetops and at the grassroots, if you look at this deficit, state after state after state, that uh, this form of political corruption, these lies, conspiracy theories, uh, false claims, legal, factual, are being repudiated, that gives me hope. Is that every, does that mean that every single person is gonna be reached? No. But if you look at um, the history of democracy, you find this is a good place to end, Chuck. If I remain fundamentally optimistic that we're gonna make progress against corruption in Ukraine, in the United States, globally, financial corruption, but that also democracy is gonna continue to push forward. Um, and part of the reason uh, that I'm optimistic about it is because I think that people actually care. You know, I'll tell a story to end. In the, I worked on the, uh, and I advised the Donald Trump presidential transition. I do that every presidential cycle. I made myself on the rules you need to fight corruption. I advised his opponent and I advised him. Um, and uh, uh, I really found that among the Trump voters, the message of drain the swamp was a motivator. I worked with an extreme conservative, Peter Schweitzer, you can look it up online. He's like the me of Breitbart or Trump. The Trump world, he was Steve Bannon's close colleague at Breitbart. But we agreed on these forms of corruption that had crept into our government. And it is very swampy in both sides. When I left the White House after two years to go be ambassador, the lobbyist said, and this was a Democratic lobbyist who was a friend of mine, he 
said, this is the greatest victory we've had in two years of the Obama administration, that Eisen is moving to Prague. So I think that there is, I think that there's a hunger on both sides of the aisle against corruption. I think the people of Ukraine are sick of corruption. And Zelensky didn't just fire the defense minister and everybody else to please the donor countries. He knows he has to keep the people of the country uh, t happy, together, unified in a time of war. They have to feel a sense uh, of, of morale as a nation. And I think that these issues are essential to our democratic future. So I'm optimistic that over time, we'll reach more and more of those people. The fever will break uh, and, um, uh, and uh, it will get better. And I look at the 2022 election as vindicating that, that notion. And my faith is also vindicated by all of you, our wonderful, uh, our wonderful rule of law scholars from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, uh, the um, CILE program here, Ralph, your great work, Chuck, what you do, Pitt, all those great LLM students who are in Ukraine fighting the good fight, um, that gives me uh, hope and confidence and your wonderful questions and your wonderful reception. Very encouraging. So thank you for having me and uh, invite me back. I loved it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Eisen. We have a tradition with the McLean Lecture, and I'm going to assume that those mics are picking up the, uh, In order to thank you for your oh. time, we want to give you a, a timepiece. Uh, and, and this clock is, is something that only McLean lecturers have. It, it, let me read on the top. It says, the 30th Annual M.W. McLean Lecture on International Law, February 7, 2023, presented to Ambassador Norm Eisman. Center for International Legal Education. Wow. But it has embedded a piece of the Berlin Wall. Fantastic. As a, as a reminder that positive change can come in peaceful ways, including the rule of law. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ralph. Wow, I'm glad. I'll carry it with me everywhere. <laughs> Corruption's time is up. <laughs> And may I present you with a gift? Certainly. <laughs> we arranged to, uh, uh, this is my first book, I've written five, but I'm proudest of this book. And it's very apropos of what we've discussed today. It's called The Last Palace, and it's the story of the transatlantic relationship, United States and Europe over the past hundred years, and the fight for democracy, and the downs, but also the ups and uh, the same optimistic tales. So may I present one to you? I got Thank mine you so here. <laughs> and Chuck has his. I have it already, I read it. Good <laughs> audio. So much. Thank you, <laughs> wonderful, I love that. So nice. We have a reception out in the, in the lobby, so if you have any other questions, we'll be here for about a half hour uh, out in the lobby. Please join Thanks us, and well. thank you to those online who join us. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was so that fun. Was good. good. Uh, we'll have a nice box for that. Oh, good. Good, okay. Oh, look at that. We'll make it easier. Yeah, I don't see Recording stopped.